Historically Black colleges and universities are more than their well-known homecomings. HBCUs are sources of great pride, history, accomplishments, and community. Most notably, they have an important role in the African-American community as schools that first gave Black students the opportunity to obtain higher education when virtually no other colleges would. The 104 HBCUs in the United States with more than 228,000 students enrolled give Black entrepreneurs hope and have a clear role in the future of the U.S. economy by creating a pipeline of talent, especially in the STEM fields. By 2044, the nation's prosperity will rely even more on minorities in entrepreneurship as a sure pathway to wealth creation. Because of that, HBCUs will have more than a $14.8 billion positive impact on the economy annually. From inception to the present, HBCUs are aligned to help inclusively move the nation forward for all Americans. Welcome everyone. My name is Amira Uji and I'm the Director of Portfolio Engagement at Revolution's Rise of the Rest Seed Fund. Thank you for joining us on day two of the Rise of the Rest virtual tour, the Equity Edition. Today is focused on entrepreneurship in HBCUs. I myself am an alum of the real HU, Howard University, and know how crucial these historic institutions are to creating racial equity in this country, including the startup economy. Millions of people throughout this country may live in close proximity to an HBCU and don't even know it, and let alone know what an HBCU is. Today is as much about celebrating the contributions of historically Black colleges and universities as it is about activating those millions of potential allies. Universities play a crucial role in our startup communities. We at Rotor also incorporate them in our programming on our Rise of the Rest tours. So while we cannot visit campuses in person in 2020, we wanted to bring some of the magic and inspiration directly to you. So let's get into the day. Our first panel will be hosted by Carla Harris, Vice Chairman and Senior Client Advisor at Morgan Stanley and one of Wall Street's most senior women of color. She'll be joined by Kyron Blanks, Chief Growth Officer of OHA Futures. OHA Futures offers training and development opportunities for Black Americans via partnerships with employers, universities, and more. They recently launched the coding boot camp at Morehouse College called Momentum at Morehouse. Also joining is Vern Howard, co-founder and CEO of Hollow, a Rise of the Rise portfolio company based in LA. How Hollow's technology is bringing innovation to the way today's top companies and student candidates connect around job opportunities with an emphasis on serving schools and students previously overlooked by major companies. And at Morgan Stanley, Carla Harris's long-term championship of recruiting from HBCUs is now further cemented through the firm's recently announced Morgan Stanley HBCU Scholars Program, which is designed to support the career aspirations of students at three of the top HBCUs, Howard University, Morehouse College, and Spelman College. But before we get into the panel, let's learn a bit more about the program. The scholarship program includes three components. First, we will provide full scholarships for 60 students over the course of the next four years at all three institutions. The scholarship will cover the full cost of tuition and room and board. Secondly, we will provide career support for the students through mentorship and through interaction with our colleagues here at Morgan Stanley. And lastly, we will work closely with the faculty and staff to ensure the success of the students. I'm thrilled to announce this as part of our broader commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we look forward to expanding this into the future. I am delighted that Morgan Stanley has joined Morehouse in what we refer to as a partnership of purpose to make a difference in the world. Our students are the epitome of academic excellence. Our high performing Spelman students are already developing innovative solutions to some of the world's most complex challenges. The generous four-year full scholarships that Morgan Stanley is providing will support some of our most talented Spelman students. While the pool of talented black job candidates in our country is strong and getting stronger every day, Morgan Stanley and Howard both understand the need to continue to strengthen the black talent pipeline. 
We are most appreciative to have this partnership with Morgan Stanley and we look forward to working together on our mutual goals of increasing educational opportunities for African American students. As we get started, I'd like to leave you with a couple of thoughts, and I'm specifically speaking to the entrepreneurs or, or would-be entrepreneurs in this audience. And I know we have the entire ecosystem here. We have investors, we have entrepreneurs, we have asset owners. But right now, I want to talk to the entrepreneurs. There are three pearls, as I like to call them, Carlos pearls, my hard-earned and hard-learned pearls after being a woman on Wall Street as of this summer for 33 years that I want to leave you with. The first one is your authenticity is your distinct competitive advantage. Nobody can be you the way that you can be you. And the minute that you're trying to be someone that you're not or speak in a way that is inauthentic to who you are, that's when you create a competitive disadvantage. When you bring your authentic self into any environment, people trust you. And trust is at the heart of any successful relationship. This is particularly important if you are an entrepreneur, because you should remember that whenever someone is in your presence, they are consuming you. So you should always be thoughtful about what kind of experience you want someone to have when they are in your person, when they are in your space. What kind of experience do you want them to have? What you, do you want them to say about having had an experience or an encounter with you? This is extremely important as I talk about the second pearl. You should be disproportionately focused on building relationships. Relationships is one of the most important tools in your tool chest. Each of us have three things in common in our tool chest. You have your intellect, you have your experience, and you have your network. And your network is the most important tool in your tool chest because it's not what you know, as I'm sure you've heard, it's about who you know. And the more relationships you have, the more leverage you will be able to have as you access investors, as you access information, as you access new opportunities for your business. A lot of it is about who you know. So while you should be focused on the product or the process that you're going to bring to market, you should not do that to the exclusion of building relationships because these relationships will be critical to your success, as I said, as you try to access capital, as you access new customers, as you access new opportunities, be disproportionately focused on building relationships. Now, for those of you out there who think you are an introvert and say, it's all about my product, it's all about my company, I'm not great at building relationships, then you have to remember that it's not about whether or not somebody likes you, it's about whether or not they know you when they're making critical decisions about your company or to invest in your company behind closed doors. So you should make sure that you invest in the relationships at the same time that you are investing in the success of your company. Now, the last point that I wanna leave you with is the power of your ask. So often we have these great relationships, but we fail to ask. We fail to exercise our voice. Your voice is at the heart of your power, especially now in the environment that we're in now where everybody's listening. You have a unique asset in this environment as a person of color who has aspirations to start a business because there's a lot of capital out here that's looking for you. Oh, don't get me wrong. It's still a very difficult environment for entrepreneurs of color to raise capital or to raise a fund but there are far more people that have identified themselves to be looking for you than there were this time last year and certainly than, than existed 10 years ago. So as I close, I tell you, it's about your authenticity. It's your distinct competitive advantage. Be focused on how people are consuming you. Focus on the relationships, invest, 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 and then leverage your voice, the power of your ask it, there is, Frank, there's no limits around it. You must exercise your voice. You must be willing to ask at critical moments. And the only reason we don't ask, you know, is that we're scared. We're just scared. It's fear. And entrepreneurs, I tell you, that fear has no place in your success equation. Fear has no place in your success equation. Anytime you approach anything in your life, personally or professionally from a position of fear, 
you always under leverage that opportunity. And now it is my honor and privilege to have this conversation with Kyron and Byrne. And so let me just throw out a macro question, gentlemen. We have a lot of different people in this audience today, but critical players in the ecosystem. We have investors, we have entrepreneurs, we have builders of the ecosystem. What's the macro message that you want them to get before we start this conversation? Yeah, um, this is Vern, so thanks for the introduction. I would say that the biggest thing that I want everyone to take away from this is we're all here to help each other, um, investors, entrepreneurs, um, even, even builders in the ecosystem. As I continue to look at this space and how much it's grown since I've been working in this space now, um, it is totally all about relationships and, and realizing that we're all here to enhance one another's job and work together to make whatever we're building successful. And if we can find better solutions to work with each other, whether we're from HBCUs or Ivy Leagues or whatever school or wherever background we come from and we can value each other's experiences, we'll have a much better uh, time as we continue to build these great technologies. So that's like really big for me. Yeah. Carrot? I'll take it away. Um, if I can get one message across to our audience today, um, I want to highlight that we are experiencing one of the greatest wealth, wealth building been, um, events in our lifetime and possibly even in history with the digital revolution. And uh, what's even more important is that this is one of the first wealth building revolutions that Black people can, in fact, participate in at scale. Um, however, there are some bottlenecks, possibly some exclusionary practices, or even heightened barriers to entry um, that are in the way of everyone everywhere fully benefiting. Um, in fact, some research from the Aspen Institute um, had revealed that the, the infrastructure for technology, early exposure and training um, has long been disintegrated in and in fact, inefficient. Um, a problem that continues to leave many black and brown students and professionals alike paces behind their peers. And just to, to paint a picture for our audience today, um, I'll use some data from a 2019 technical technology representation report rather that underscored that black Americans um, and Latinos or Hispanics people representing 13 and 18% of our US population respectively are represented at a fraction of that in the technology industry with black Americans at 7% and Latino and Hispanic um, persons representing only 1% higher at 8%. Um, this is especially concerning when you compare that um, data to that of white American representation in the field where the group represents 60% of the US population and a staggering 68% of the US tech um, populace. Um, this becomes more troubling, in fact, when you factor in the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 has had on communities of color and that they, and that is continue to be projected um, to um, as continue to project um, negative impact as automation sets in. Um, in fact, McKinsey uh, predicted that 4.5 million jobs occupied by Black Americans will be disrupted um, by automation this 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 decade. And so, what I want our audience to know is, you know, you ask yourself, what can you do? Um, at OHUB, we've spent the last seven years revolutionizing, increasing, and normalizing Black and Brown wealth creation and black and brown faces in tech, um, but we can't do it alone. Uh, with your help, uh, we can continue to democratize and decolonize technology as we know it. And so keeping in mind these looming realities, my ask is that um, you find it in your heart to empathize, prioritize and invest in the social and economic mobility of black and brown communities. Um, you have a chance to make history with us or to in fact make an excuse. And I trust that with your power, your influence and good consciousness, you will make the right choice. Now, Karen, you, you have obviously created uh, an outstanding platform technology, you know, startup, uh, a platform that is focused on technology, focused on startups and focused on, on venture funding. So can you tell us a little bit about OHUB and frankly, how you intersect with the HBCUs? Absolutely. Um, a little bit about um, OHA Futures, just for some context. Um, we are um, confronting one of our country's longest standing issues, and that is the undereducation, underrepresentation, and underemployment of Black and historically underserved communities um, in America. So, ranging from college students to working professionals, we are, in fact, um, delivering leading edge curriculum and exposure to exponential tools and technologies uh, to prepare our students for upwardly mobile careers in technology. With our hiring partners. Um, our mission is to skill 
reskill and upskill 1 million black and brown people by the year 2025 um, to enable them to fully participate in this very lucrative um, digital revolution. Um, so we're working both to disrupt and reinvent the education and workforce training infrastructure um, to fundamentally future-proof and accelerate pathways into highly sought well-compensated career paths in business and technology. And uh, most importantly, towards new wealth creation uh, for communities who really need it the most. And so um, as it relates to um, our relationships with um, HBCUs, uh, we work in partnership with them to achieve two main goals. And that is to um, expose the students and surround the community to the most in-demand um, skills um, and, and, and career opportunities and to get them hired through our global network of large corporations, big tech and venture backed high growth companies. Um, for example, most recently um, in partnership with Morehouse College and with Momentum Learning, uh, we effectively launched Morehouse at Momentum, a full stack engineering bootcamp um, that has graduated two cohorts, approximately 50 um, students who all self identify as black or Latin X um, as full stack developers this year. And um, our, our work isn't stopping, um, we recently announced um, four new um, skill partnerships um, that's now enabling us to offer um, full stack JavaScript, cybersecurity, blockchain, ethical AI, and technical sales. Um, and coupled with that, we announced a recent, um, our, we're working with partner, with our partnership with LEAF, uh, we've announced a um, $50 million income shared agreement um, that will be, that is specifically focused on our students to um, essentially over, o overcome some of those bottlenecks that they often run into whenever um, they run it, whenever they apply for student loans, be it um, credit checks, um, debt income ratios. So um, having some of our um, working with the so conscious investors um, to, 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 to lighten that burden on, on, on our students. And um, yes, um, our, our work is continuing and uh, we're continuing to spread our reach and our impact across a number of other universities as well. Wow, that is outstanding, Karen. Now here's a nice intersection. So Vern, as a successful entrepreneur uh, and someone who would have had access and would have benefited from uh, OHUB, let's talk a little bit about the amazing job that you've done with Hollow um, yeah. and how you have helped uh, students of color get access to tech jobs. And let's talk about how your lived experience influenced the way you built uh, and, and you know, are scaling that company. Right. I think it's for sure. I took my personal experience and life journey to, to get here to and that kind of what shaped me building hollow. So quickly, you know, I, I'm from Rochester, New York. I, I so I grew up essentially around some decent schools, but there's nothing else as far as exposure to Silicon Valley. Um, graduated at 16, played lacrosse all through high school, which is definitely uh, outside of range for someone who looks like me and, and then didn't know what I wanted to do after I graduated at 16, ended up studying computer science at Virginia Commonwealth University, taking a job at Capital One, building out their mobile banking application, rotated over to being the first white hat hacker early on at Capital One. And then I started trading my bonus and they hired me to actually sit on the derivatives trading floor at Capital One. So I did all that like right before I turned, I think like 24. Um, wow. In that experience, Capital One would actually take me as the poster child to kind of talk to students at HBCUs, especially launching the program at Howard University and going to Morehouse to do a ton of case studies. And one thing I just noticed off the bat was like going from a, a school such as Stanford and then going to another HBCU, it wasn't that, you know, the talent wasn't there. It was just the level of exposure to the knowledge of like the how to get a job at certain companies, call it Google or Facebook certain students were way more prepared of the vernacular of how to get a job there. And then it was just a network, right? How do you take the knowledge that you have at this point and then utilize it and activate it with your network? I think you said that in your earlier speech. And for me, I was just like, if I could build a solution that lets every student, regardless of like where they go to school or their background or where they come from, such as me, build those relationships at scale and the information to move forward, would they be, they'd, they'd rock and ship ahead. And since then, we've kind of built out this online events platform that lets any student now interact with the top companies in the nation. So we posted events for some of the largest companies, Netflix, BlackRock, Riot Games. And um, in that vein, we really wanted to focus on HBCU. So we're in over 1,225 universities today. But we recently announced a, a partnership with UNCF. Uh, one of our advisors is Jim Shelton, um, who, who you know has worked on the Department of Education with Obama and CZI. Um, and we really want to double down there to focus on especially HBCU students. So now every HBCU student that is in UNCF, STEM scholars will be utilizing Hollow to interact with the top companies in the nation. And wow. I think and that's really huge because it's something I would have loved to be able to do uh, 
at, at my age graduating and kind of having no clue of where to go. You um, and I me think both. really huge. Yeah. So oh, that's outstanding. Providing access, that's very valuable, my friend, very valuable. So Karen, what are you hearing from HBCU students about the, the challenge or lack thereof in the case if they have hollow, they might not have the same challenge, but what are you hearing from students about entering the tech space, about entering the VC space, um, how they feel about it now? Honestly, um, I've gotten mixed reviews, you know. Um, I have many HBCU students I've, I've engaged with have expressed, um, they feel like they've experienced a rather chilly climate. Um, in the in the STEM space, met with the lack of representation in the programs, um, just comfortable with bringing their full authentic selves into different spaces and conversations, and they're constantly feeling like a search, like they're in search of a sense of community and uh, familiarity. Um, that's also um, countered by persons I've met who have um, met that with much resilience and um, who have been able to move through it seamlessly. A young lady I actually had the privilege to work with closely who graduated from my um, Tech Bootcamp, um, Miss uh, uh, Nicole Ross, um, Delta Sigma Theta, um, math and education and consultant background. Um, she actually moved to Atlanta, Georgia um, to take advantage of an opportunity and um, in higher education, but was had to, but had her offer rescinded as a result of COVID. She then enrolled in the bootcamp and um, while raising two kids uh, with no source of income, uh, persevered and after 200 um, job applications and interviews later, um, she was able to increase her income by $30,000 and become an associate software engineer um, with a company called Exactly. I believe it's one of Robert Smith's um, companies in um, his portfolio actually. And so, you know, just, Again, a, a stark contrast, but I think one that um, is representative of the um, full Black lived experience in America, where there are some of us who are marching through life like soldiers, and there are others who um, are a little bit more emotionally impacted and, and traumatized by the realities in which they are confronted with. Yes. Well, in our last minute, gentlemen, each of you, 30 seconds, tell me, what does the future hold? What does your company look like when it has been successful? Vern, I'll start with you. Cool. Yeah, so the biggest thing for me is I hire a diverse with a diverse hat on. And in the future, I would love for everyone who kind of works with me, around me, or uh, invest in, in our company to go out and start their own companies and, and hire diverse talent from different backgrounds. And that's just like what I'm really focused on is building that ecosystem up. So. Oh, I thought you were going to say a success looks like Morgan Stanley taking me public. I'd like to do that, Vern. Come on. I will, I will definitely contact you after <laughs> that, after, the, after this meeting about that. <laughs> okay. And Karen, what does success look like? When you have been successful, how do you know? What does success look like? Success for me looks like Black and brown people showing up with a single consciousness. One that does not have to take into account racialized oppression and disvaluation in the otherwise white dominated space. I'm just one we can show up our most authentic selves. We can breathe. We don't have to sit on the edge of our seats when we're in these meetings. And uh, we can bring our narrative to the table and we can um, invite that into these algorithms that are being built, into these products that are being built so that our needs can be met and solved with context. That is what success looks like for me. And it also looks like Morgan Stanley reaching out to OHA. <laughs> I heard that. Well, Karen, Vern, it's been my honor. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Carla, Karen, and Vern. You know, Carla, you dropped a gem for the entrepreneurs today. Fear has no place in your success equation. Clearly, there are many ways we can all collaborate and connect with HBCUs across the country. We are also seeing prominent HBCU graduates step up to call for action, policy change, and partnership to help close the racial equity gap in tech. One important example comes from Dr. David Marion, the chairman of the Council of Presidents of the National Pan-Hellenic Council, representing all 2.5 million members of the Divine Nine, the nine historically African-American Greek-lettered fraternities and sororities. Prior to the election, the National Pan-Hellenic Council delivered an open letter to both presidential candidates, proposing a collaborative plan to reskill, start, and accelerate Black America for new wealth in today's future. And now, Dr. Marion. I'm Dr. David Marion, and I serve as the Grand Basilis of the Omega Psi Phi Fraternity Incorporated, and also the Chairman of the Council of Presidents of the Divine Nine. 
And this, this issue of trying to address the racial disparity wealth gap that we see in this country has become so important to all of the presidents of the Divine Nine. Particularly, I remember a survey recently where I read that the average net worth of a white family in the Boston area was 245,000, and the net worth of an African-American family in the Boston area was $8. I remember being struck by that, that I read that, and I reread it multiple times looking for some more zeros, but there weren't any. And so we understand uh, in our organizations the impact of structural racism. Uh, we understand that African-Americans somehow were left out of the industrial revolution. And we don't wanna see our people and other people of color left out of the tech revolution. And so we have gone on record asking and requesting the, the Biden-Harris administration to do some impactful things in their first 100 days. Uh, we've asked them to convene uh, and create an initiative, a White House initiative to address the uh, racial wealth disparity gap. Uh, we've talked about getting Congress involved with passing legislation that would be more inclusive of African-Americans getting the trainings for tech jobs. People are beginning to see that the way to close that wealth disparity gap is to um, line up opportunities for African-Americans to get tech jobs. How can tech companies become more diverse in, in their organizations uh, is to create a, a diverse tech talent pool. And how can they do that? They can do boot camps on HBCU campuses and make it all come together, uh, help invest in curriculum that can um, help African-Americans and other people of color be able to be ready for those type of jobs to address the need that they say they have, which is to make certain they have a more diverse workforce. Uh, so we think the letter is, is very impactful. All of the presidents of the Divine Nine that represent 2.5 million members, all of them have said that they think this is one of the most important issues of our time to address issues of education, to address issues of, of wealth, uh, to address issues of housing, to address issues of health care in our community. Thank you, Dr. Marion, for all the work that you're doing. We do not want to see people of color left out. Beyond alumni and students, HBCU presidents are also directly driving innovation and helping to inspire the next generation of leaders. Their calls to action offer important lessons for each of us. We are fortunate to have some of, those, some of those presidents here with us today. First, we have President Colette Pierce Burnett of Houston Tillotson University in Austin, Texas, in a conversation with Rodney Sampson. Not many people know that there's an HBCU in Austin. They may think of South by Southwest, the Longhorns, or the state capitol first. Under President Burnett's leadership, Houston Tillotson has built ties to the high energy South by Southwest tech community with the help of Rodney and OHUB. Let's hear from President Burnett and Rodney. Thanks, Amira. It's great to be here with you today, President Burnett. I think you offer such valuable perspective. To kick things off, what is the overarching point you want to get across to this audience of students, investors, entrepreneurs, and ecosystem builders? The um, key thing I want to get across is commitment, continuity, and focus. When we have commitment, continuity, and focus to a goal, you will achieve it particularly to the students. Um, take advantage of these opportunities. These are not small things. These are grand opportunities. And you're a sponge. So you soak in all this knowledge that you get from events and activities and initiatives like this, and it starts to grow you in the direction of what you're trying to go. So that's the key thing I wanted um, to, to, to really, particularly students, is that commitment, that continuity, and that focus. What should allies, um, white allies in particular, do, uh, whether individual, foundations, 
um, corporations, what should they do to collaborate with HBCU leaders like yourself across the country to create racial equity in their startup communities and beyond? So in my response, I'm going to give a couple shout outs to make a, a, an analogy. Um, I've, I've done a lot of thinking about this um, for obvious reasons, because through COVID-19, we had to start a support fund. Um, when we decided to go online, a small school like ours, we lost a lot of revenue, like $1.6 million revenue when we decided to do the safe thing, the right thing for my campus to go fully online. So. I've done a lot of thinking about this in my roles in philanthropy and fundraising. And there are, there are allies, there are accomplices, and there are co-conspirators. And um, I'm looking for accomplices and co-conspirators. Right. Um, I'll take the allies, but the allies kind of give me $10, which doesn't buy a book, and they stand on the sideline and kind of cheer you on. That's an ally in this fight. Um, I learned through the Black Lives Matter uh, movement uh, moment, which um, we were, our campus hosted the Black Lives Matter rally on campus, which was had over 20,000 people on campus. It was, it was, it was phenomenal for me as just as a black woman. But um, I learned there that Black Lives Matter in, pri in public, because everybody's putting these statements out. But then at the private moment of the ask, where Black Lives Don't Matter, they don't matter so much. So that's an ally. I put a statement out, I support the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I wanna do some unpaid internships for your students. That's an ally. Right. An accomplice is, I wanna partner with you. Um, I, I, it's what um, some, some uh, Josh Bear has been involved in this actually, to bring Josh Bear up again, where we've had some speakers come in and do some speaker series with our students about their experiences as an entrepreneur. Um, one young man told how he had to sell his car and live with his mother's, his um, wife's parents in order to do startup and now he's very successful. So very real stories that my students can relate to. Those are accomplices. They give you some, some monetary support, but then they go the next extra yard to really pour into the students and give them paid internships and opportunities. Co-conspirators are the ones that do that and then more. Um, uh, for example, Apple has given the university a substantial amount of funding to, to um, underwrite the cost of an African-American male teacher initiative, our uh, Green Apple with sustainability to invest in um, training our students when it comes to Apple's hardware, et cetera. And then I could Merck um, underwrites the cost of a, um, one of our faculty members. So in bioinformatics, because they wanted to combine biology and computer science into bioinformatics. Uh, we were in conversations with Tesla, who's coming to Austin. Well, actually not coming to Austin, they're in Austin, yeah. building their um, gigafact, building a gigafactory, one of their gigafactories. And we, um, they have done a series on Tesla internships. Uh, we are in conversations with them now about building out our engineering program with the curriculum that they will, will hire our students if they complete this program successfully. That's a co-conspirator. Yes. When someone asks me about what corporations can do, you can get away from the big five that I talked about earlier, those schools that give, you know, and, and invest your money and really dig into HBCUs. There are over a hundred of us and find the one that you want to be a co-conspirator or an accomplice with and really see true investment, have gains on that investment by investing in young people, because it's really about opportunities, as back to the, the, the art overarching, the rise of the rest. Yes. Um, because there's so much hidden talent that is untapped that we, we need to, as a nation, as an entity, as a globe, invest in those young people that don't have those opportunities, because it's about so many more entrepreneurs, so many more teachers, so many more educators, so many more Rodney Sampson's out there um, that we need someone, some entity to really take dollars and invest to, to heal as well as investing to grow as opposed to just investing to grow. Because when we start investing to heal, and by that I mean to close the racial divide, fight, dismantle those barriers, those you know those systemic um, 
racist barriers, when we start truly dismantling those barriers, that's what I mean by investing to heal. And the best way to do that is to invest in young people of color to give them the opportunity. Thanks, Rodney and Dr. Burnett. Three words to remember from this, commitment, continuity, and focus. I know we've got a ton of people here with us today who are allies, and I'm excited to see everyone go beyond that to be allies and co-conspirators. Up next, we'll hear from President Michael Sorrell of Paul Quinn College in Dallas, Texas, in conversation with Rise of the Rest partner, Anna Mason. It is so great to be with you today, President Sorrell. Thank you for making time to join us. I know that you offer such an invaluable perspective, and we asked you to join us today to talk a little bit about uh, innovation on HBCU campuses, um, which we had the opportunity to experience firsthand uh, at Res the Rest Dallas a couple of years ago. Um, so to kick things off, uh, you know, just help ground this conversation in what is the most compelling fact or statistic to you? Like what is really the overarching point um, that you'd love to get across to our audience of investors and entrepreneurs and ecosystem builders from across the country? Sure, no, and it is always wonderful to be with you and the, and the Rise family. Um, I, I will tell you just out of the gate, I, I don't think about innovation and problem solving strictly from an HBCU perspective. Um, for me, for the work that we do at Paul Quinn, we're looking at it a bit more expansively and we are addressing poverty, right? I mean, we think the great issue of our time is poverty. We're trying to solve for poverty. And that becomes particularly important when you look at it through the HBCU lens because Anywhere between two-thirds and 70% of all HBCU students are on Pell Grants, um, which means that they come from the lowest socioeconomic strata in this country. At Paul Quinn College, annually, we are 80 to 85% Pell Grant students. 70% um, of our students have zero expected family contributions. Um, so the magnitude of, of deficits economically that these students have and, and what that produces um, really inspires us to think creatively and think outside the box. And listen, lest you think that we are in some odd category, we are now a country where the majority of our students who are in public schools are coming from low income and poverty backgrounds. So there is a case to be made that the American educational system for public institutions or, or public schools is now defined by poverty. The entire southern rung of our country, those states, well over 50 percent of many of them, their students are in poverty. So we, we now innovate not because we have the luxury of time or the luxury of scratching a creative itch. We are innovating because of the necessity of what it means to care for people who are coming to you having been failed by the institutions of this country. When we visited you in 2018, we got to experience what I would call your football field to farm experiment um, and initiative. Can you recount the story and the vision behind that? And, and I'm curious, what impact has it had on the students and the surrounding community in its first couple years? And to the extent you're able to operate during COVID, um, where now there's such an intense focus on food supply chain and resiliency, um, where, where, if anything, has that shifted in 2020? Sure, sure, no. So not being overly dramatic, but that football field to farm conversion saved our school. And it saved our school, not because we made so much money off the produce, but what it did was it forced people to see us differently and to see us as an engine of innovation, right? And not an institution of struggle. And that, that change, that ability to stand up and fight for ourselves, um, to present things of value, to change the narrative, 
was just extraordinary. I mean, listen, we, and, and let me be clear, we created it because we were mad, right? I mean, like, there was no game plan. We didn't do a feasibility study. It is the absolute, like, truthfully, you all never would have invested in us if we had come with the business model. We're going to turn the football field into a farm. No, we haven't done any research. No, we don't have an agricultural program. We're just mad, right? I can imagine that would have been a very short conversation. But what happened was that we were in a food desert and the community that surrounds the college was closer to the city garbage dump than it was a grocery store, which really just stop and think about that for a moment. What are you saying to people that they are closer to a garbage dump than a grocery store? And so I naively thought, how hard could it be to get a grocery store, right? Like I played Monopoly as a kid. I studied economics. Like I understand the concept. If you don't have something, you bring something, you capture all the revenue from having it, right? Turns out it wasn't quite that easy. And we spent two years giving away land and no one would take us up on it. We said, look, we'll give you land if you just agree to open up a farm. I mean, to open up a grocery store. And no one would do it. And one day, I was at I got a, came back from lunch. It was during the most difficult period of my presidency, and it was a pretty depressing time. And my assistant said that Trammell Crow, who Trammell S. Crow, who is the son of the real estate developer, um, had called. And I thought it was a prank because I didn't know Trammell, and I didn't know why Trammell would be calling me. And so it turns out he wanted to go to lunch. We went to lunch. And we hit it off, and we hit it off so well, you know, I'm thinking, here's my shot. I'm going to ask for a grocery store, right? Ask for the money to build a grocery store. And I start, you know, working my way into that pitch, and he completely sidesteps it, right? I mean, I'm literally like, oh, you know, what the people in my neighborhood need in this community, they need a grocery store. And he literally is like, you know what I'm passionate about? I'm passionate about community gardens. And... I had never put the word community and garden together in a sentence before in my life, but I'm very clear that this means I'm not getting a grocery store. So I pivot, right? And my response is, you know, I recently have become fascinated by community gardens myself, which was entirely true. Just in the last three minutes, I had become fascinated by community gardens. And he offers to give us money to build a community garden. Um, you know, I asked for money for a a community garden on our campus and one more in the community, because I think the mistake people make when they're doing um, neighborhood and community revitalization is they don't think about depth, right? You need more than one of things to really kind of start a, a renaissance. And that's how it started. Like it should have never worked. And then when Pepsi came in and I pitched them like literally same kind of way, I was like, hey, we should turn the whole football field into a farm. And they asked, they said, well, do you have an agriculture program? And I was sort of like, no, do you think we need one? Right? And they were like, okay. And they asked me something else that I, my answer was no. And so I, you know, excused myself because I didn't like where it was trending. And I called someone in my, my youngest member of my staff. And I said, hey, weren't you an economics major in college? And she says, yes. And I said, um, great, you're going to run our farm. And she says, well, we don't have a farm. I said, well, we're about to have a farm. And she said, I don't know anything about farming. I was like, why are you bringing me down with the details? I was like, just Google it, okay? Just Google it. Literally, that's how the farm started. She Googled what grows in Dallas. Um, and we just, we didn't know what we didn't know. We just knew people deserved better. There were plenty of design flaws, like the fact that we built a farm with no irrigation system except for hoses. So we would stand out there and spray water for the first summer. The crops would grow in a very uneven fashion, as one might imagine. Uh, but now we've got this, I think it's up to four acres of land. We have a 3,000 square foot greenhouse. We've grown over 60,000 60, pounds of food. Uh, the Dallas Cowboys are our largest customer. We sent way more kale to the NFL than we ever sent football players um, when we had a football team. So it, it's this is what grassroots innovation looks like. This is how you speak to the needs of communities. And this is what we have replicated at each turn at our institution in the last 10 or 11 years. 2020 
has been a year that people will talk about and study for the rest of history, right? I mean, I, like we are living in that moment. But for someone like me, who is wired to problem solve, who's wired to, you know, live for challenges, in some very real sense, it's a gift because it allows me to go back into the lab and just reimagine everything. And so, you know, what I told our staff in literally March, when all of this started to go left, I said, listen, the history of higher education is full of examples of institutions who stepped forward during times of national crisis and remade themselves and remade themselves in ways that, that it happened to be capable of sustaining themselves going forward. I said, this is going to be our moment. So we're going to remake the entire institution in almost every conceivable way. This is a moment where society, where students, where communities, they don't need run-of-the-mill colleges anymore. They need activist colleges. They need institutions that meet people where they are, listen to the will of the people, listen to the needs of the people. Institutions that are less in love with their traditions and more in love with their missions and their communities and their students. And for those types of institutions, I don't know if there could be a better era than one where there have been so many failings that it has created opportunities for others to stand in the gap, and we are standing in that gap. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It lights up my day to have the opportunity to catch up with you. It reminds me how much we at Rise of the Rest miss being out on the road and meeting people and leaders like you where you are. Um, but I'm uh, I'm grateful to you that we get to revisit uh, some of these stories and just the extraordinary vision um, and grit uh, that you and your team and your students continue to to put forward every day. It's uh, it's certainly an inspiration against the backdrop of 2020. So thank you, and back to you, Amira. Thanks, Anna, and thank you, President Sorrell, for joining us. You know, I applaud. Paul Quinn College for solving for poverty and the economic deficit across educational institutions. I joined Rise of the Rest earlier this year, but I wish I could have been on the team for that visit to Dallas. We are so fortunate to have so many HBCU presidents join us today. And it's my honor to introduce our final HBCU president. This is a special one for me as it features the president of my alma mater, Howard University. <laughs> um, Dr. Frederick is featured in, in a conversation with Ted Leonsis, chairman of, and CEO of Monumental Sports and a founding partner of Revolution Growth, Revolution's fund backing growth stage companies. The two men have been collaborating on ways to bring their organizations closer. I'll turn it over to my colleague, Jay Floyd, to moderate what will no doubt be an interesting and thought-provoking discussion. Hello. Today we're joined by Ted Leonsis, co-founder and partner of Revolution Growth, our late stage fund. Ted is a nationally renowned entrepreneur, investor, and sports team owner. He's founder, chairman, majority owner, and CEO of Monumental Sports and Entertainment, home of the 2018 Stanley Cup champion Washington Capitals, the NBA's Washington Wizards, and the WNBA's Washington Mystic sports teams. It's also my pleasure to have with us today, Dr. Wayne Frederick, the 17th president of Howard University and the distinguished Charles Drew Professor of Surgery. Dr. Frederick was appointed president in 2014 and he is presiding over what he refers to as the school's coming of age. Part of that includes a renewed focus on social innovation and entrepreneurship central to our conversation today. So gentlemen, welcome, let's jump right in. Before we begin, I wanna talk data. What's the most powerful fact or statistic that you'd like to share, which really demonstrates what you're trying to achieve in your work? Dr. Frederick, how about you go first? Yeah, you know, people don't often associate health with wealth. So one of the statistics that I always try to remind people of is that a black man in America today uh, lives some 20 years less uh, than the average white woman. So if you use Warren Buffett's compound interest, one of the factors in that is time. And if you don't have time, you can't create 
that type of wealth, which then creates generational wealth. And so that statistic always resonates with me that if we can close healthcare disparities, um, it can lead to significant wealth um, initiation and development uh, in the black community. Ted, what about you? Well, I stumbled unfortunately on a stat today that I, I had to drill down on because I didn't believe it, which was that the number one um, killer of young people in America is suicide. And that mental health had become such a overlooked, under-discussed um, issue. And Dr. Frederick has to deal with this with young students on campus, but that you know, we're living in this time of great um, stat watching, be it the election, be it COVID, but that was a stat that I just couldn't believe that we're losing so many people taking their own life um, and we need to get to the bottom of it because that, that is uh, probably a big, big issue that needs to be faced right now. Mm -hmm. And it's really been an intense year, to say the least, for so many, especially many of those folks watching. But there's also been a lot of stories of hope out there, especially from the startup community. So I'd like to hear from each of you, you know, tell us a, a story, a quick story of a founder or a company that has really been thriving and one that has inspired you. Dr. Frederick, can you go first? Yeah, there's a company called Jupwell that I've interacted with recently. A uh, young African-American man uh, started it, and it's to try to connect more diverse, um, up, more opportunities for employment among a, a more diverse population. Um, has a really interesting platform and matrix um, by which they're going through that, and they're trying to work with universities and others uh, to connect. And I think it's a very hopeful uh, because, it, again, it's, a, it's giving people an opportunity to be employed, to, to generate income. Uh, and I think the fact that they saw the need to try to connect more, to increase, especially when you look at the unemployment rate, um, I've been very impressed with their platform. And Ted, you've invested in countless founders um, and many of color. Can you talk a little bit about um, one or two that are on your radar? Well, actually, the first uh, internet investment um, that we made at America Online, uh, we started a, it was called The Greenhouse, and we made investments in a, a freshman class. Motley Fool was one of them, but it was Net Noir, and it was the first Black programming, uh, Black application company. Uh, people were getting online at 2400, then 9600 baud, but we just saw that the internet would have great, great um, level of the playing field. And so Net Noir, we, we also made an investment and planned it out. And we really wanted to be able to hold the mirror up to uh, the communities that we served. And there were more uh, African-American and Latino uh, people getting online. That was the fastest growing segment. And I'd say right now, the company I was most proud of that pivoted the right way in the, in the pandemic is Clear, one of our investments. We know Clear was born out of 9-11, uh, biometric uh, safety and security. People weren't flying anymore. And so we pivoted that to have health pass and we could get real-time testing and get that testing information to allow you to be cleared to go into your office building or whatever. We did a deal with the NBA and the NHL and an intrapreneur, a black executive from the NBA just left the NBA to run the division to now take clear to be able to open all of the arenas. And so, you know, we have to, make a bigger definition of just you're a founder, you're an entrepreneur, people that start divisions or new product lines within big companies who, who are black, that is a big part of what we have to continue to do to give people the confidence to allow black leaders to go in, take risks and drive things and get funded. And I'm, I'm really happy that Clear has been able to do that. That's great. So Dr. Frederick, you know, entrepreneurship, it's so ingrained in the culture and the students at Howard. Um, it's a historically black university here in Washington, DC. 
So many leading CEOs and founders have matriculated at the institution. And I know that you're developing this next generation of entrepreneurial talent in something that both you and Ted are very passionate about. Can you talk to us a little bit about, you know, some of your plans for the institution, especially how you've navigated through this pandemic as you're working to implement those plans? Yeah, sure. Our biggest plan right now is we're creating a social innovation hub where we're going to put social entrepreneurship at the core and we're going to wrap it actually in the humanities and social sciences. One of the things about higher ed over the past two or three decades is we've kind of really devalued uh, social sciences and humanities, but they still represent, I would, I still believe the backbone of what's good about our higher education and what's good about our society, to be quite honest. However, the students who are coming to those uh, types of majors are not necessarily uh, being encouraged because of the lack of economic opportunities. And what we're seeing is an opportunity to give them a platform, have them use technology, data science, et cetera, and start companies that can make money, but at the same time, solve big problems. So we're looking at things like income inequality, maternal mortality, healthcare disparities, and to have them form companies with technology driving behind it, using their degrees in, in the social sciences and humanities. So we're excited about it. The pandemic actually has given even more uh, when we need the wings uh, for it because it has thrown open uh, the, the issues in our country in terms of those inequities and how it can lead to disproportionate outcomes in a pandemic, as an example. Exactly. So Ted, you know, you're one of DC's most prominent businessmen. Um, you've worked with many academic institutions like Howard to create opportunities for diverse leaders. So what advice do you give to those in the business community, to other venture capitalists who are fortunate enough to have an HBCU in their backyard? How do they work with local universities to seed future talent? Well, we, we want to make Howard front and center to um, the ecosystem and it should be take its place along all of the other uh, big institutions because we're all in need of talent. We're all in need of ideas. We're all in need of IP. Uh, to me, it always starts with students and internships and mentoring and then recruiting off of those campuses. I've always felt that Howard specifically has been underutilized and we we over-index on bringing in interns and interns end up finding the jobs within our companies. And then they reference and they get other people to come in and now they start to create their own networks. And then that's how people start their own companies. It's very infrequent that a person starts a company all by themselves. They bring teams together. I also think Howard is... Um, is very interesting because it does have science, it does have, have arts, but it is a connect the dots, develop the whole person kind of university. It also is a major research university. I mean, having the hospital, having someone with the bona fides that Dr. Frederick brings. And, you know, as you know, we make an investment in a company, a world-class company like Tempest, and the first person we think of to bring on to the board of directors of this great company is Dr. Frederick. And the only way that we could do that is by working with them, knowing what he was all about, knowing his skills. And I'm sure that that's going to lead to research dollars within the university, students being placed there, partnerships being created. And the more natural and organic that whole kind of ecosystem develops, I think the faster we'll be able to, um, ex or the, we'll be able to accelerate the onboarding really of the talent, regardless of, you know, which university they're coming from. But, but I don't think we've done a, a good enough job. And those of us as a venture capitalist or investor, and in, in our case in the sports industry, we're getting advantaged by being early on and discovering all of the gifts and talents and infrastructure that Howard University has. Exactly. And Dr. Frederick, what's your advice you know, to venture capitalists, to investment firms and CEOs, are they looking to build these programs and how they're looking to become potential allies for the community? 
You know, I, I wrote an op-ed um, about this very issue, and I was my analogy that I use is if you're going to go fish for salmon, you go where salmon live, <laughs> um, and if you want to fish for something else, you, you're going to go there. And I think what I encourage people to do is to come to the HBCUs, to come to Howard. Um, we have great talent, um, just to be clear about that. And here at Howard as well, we're talking to students more about their mission rather than their major which I think is consistent with what Ted Leonsis and, and his group have done around providing that opportunity. As you said, you wanna bring teams together. And so we're talking to students about what is your ultimate mission? I, I don't care what your major is, uh, but if, if you get a mission that's aligned with somebody else and you can collaborate, then you, you can see a bigger, brighter future. And so we want venture capitalists uh, to come in because we believe our students have that mindset. They open to the opportunity. And, and all they need is to make that connection with someone. And encouraging the students um, to be thinking of an entrepreneurial career, um, whether it be double bottom lines, companies like Dr. Frederick talked about, or community small businesses or big tech companies, it does start with on the campus, making sure that there's networking going on between marketing people and liberal arts majors and engineering majors and, and being able to celebrate what it takes to launch a business. Uh, we wanna work with the university and do our own version of Bark Tank, which I launched at Georgetown University. Rise of Rest will do contests because we find teaching students how to pitch their business idea and giving them a little money, the winners, to launch the business and fail. Most of these businesses will fail, but the, but the experience they get in the 360 view of starting, launching, bringing it out, uh, changing direction is invaluable and really adds to the richness of what Howard University or any university can deliver in terms of student experience. Mm -hmm. So gentlemen, we have about a minute left and we talk so much about, you know, inviting others to the table. Um, and I would love to hear if you were to sit down at a dinner table, once we can all gather together in person, who are the two or three individuals you'd want to make sure are sitting at that table with you? Oh. Well, Ken, Ken Chenault is um, one of the the great leaders that I've ever been around. He's the best CEO I've ever uh, been around. And we started a company and sold it to American Express. And I was able to join the board and watch Ken operate. Mm -hmm. And he had Vernon Jordan on the board. And mm -hmm. Ken was just the best CEO of a Fortune 100 company. He's retired now, and now he's in the venture capital business. He's at, with General Catalyst. And following the leaders and just, um, just watching what he does as an exemplar, his integrity, uh, his decisiveness, his ability to activate teams, um, and watching what he's been able to do during emergency situations has been how I got my MBA, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that that your relationship with a Vernon Jordan is similar, right? That, mm -hmm. that if you can can listen to your mentors, it drives a lot of your experience. And Dr. Frederick, what about you? Who's at your yeah, table? I've been asked this question several times, and I, I have the same answer, and it actually is going to be connected to something that Ted said earlier. Um, I would want my dad uh, there. Uh, Alex George Frederick, uh, he died a month shy of my third birthday from suicide. Um, I'm sure that the circumstances around that would have been difficult, but from everything else I know about him as a police officer and how dedicated he was uh, you know, to us as a family, um, I would love to be able to sit with him and learn from him because I do think that mental illness is not something that we talk about enough. And I, I'm sure that he would have amazing pearls of wisdom uh, to share with me, especially uh, in this day and age. Well, gentlemen, both of those sound like remarkable individuals. I thank you for your time and really appreciate everyone for tuning in. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us.
Thanks, Dr. Frederick, Ted, and Jade. Those were some great dinner guests, gentlemen. And to Dr. Frederick, I live just blocks away from Howard University here in DC, and I'm ready anytime you or your students want to talk about the opportunities in startups and venture capital. I'm also excited to check out the Social Innovation Hub. And that, everyone, concludes our day two of the Rise of the Res virtual tour equity edition. We heard from innovative leaders who are making the startup and tech economy more accessible for HBC graduates. We heard from leaders of these great institutions from all around the country. We even heard from a sports team owner who was stepping up to work with the HBCU in his backyard. There's something we can all do with these students and graduates. Hire, mentor, invest, and sponsor. There are many ways we can make our national startup community more diverse, and engaging with HBCUs is a good way to do that. Thanks to all the panelists and speakers, and thank you to our co-conspirators at OHUB, 100 Black Angels and Allies, and Morgan Stanley's Multicultural Innovation Lab. Thanks to all of our national partners at Silicon Valley Bank and the Kauffman Foundation. Tune in at the same time tomorrow for our main event, which includes the finals of our $2 million pitch competition. Thanks for joining us and I'll see you there.